you have your Bibles with you this morning, you can turn to the little book of Philemon or Philemon. I've heard it called both. Uh, Philemon, just one chapter, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Philemon, verse 1. The Bible says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved our Aphaia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God. Uh, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank You for Your goodness. We thank You and praise You for all that You do for us. Lord, we pray this morning that You'd meet with us as we sit before You as a needy people. God, help me to preach what You've given me to preach. Lord, we know there's no ability and nothing to be done, but if I rely on You, all will be well. Lord, we pray for the lost, Lord, this morning, that You might speak life to them. Lord, that You might uh, uh, breathe into them uh, the spiritual breath of life, Lord, and grant them repentance today. Lord God, we pray uh, that we would be a people that would walk close to You and that would be obedient when You've given us things to do. Lord, we pray that You would just be with us in an unusual way and we'd be faithful to praise You for it. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, unusual little book because there's actually two authors, Timothy and Paul, are writing this together. And by the time this occurred, Timothy had also been arrested. He had also been locked up. And they were now together, not as fellow helpers, but fellow prisoners. And they were uh, reviewing some things that the Lord had really done for them along the way. Now, uh, I'll just throw this in. It's not the uh, focus of the message today, but most of the time, we wouldn't do enough to be arrested if Christianity became illegal. <laughs> Uh, we wouldn't be, there would be not enough evidence to lock us up because uh, we were not the caliber that these two men were, uh, but they were arrested for what they believed and what they did. Uh, he begins, uh, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother. Again, they were, they were there together. And I want you to make note that uh, uh, he, he made a mention that they were brothers, brothers in Christ. They weren't biologically related, but they knew the same father. And if you remember, uh, as Timothy, as he's writing Timothy one time, he says, I'm convinced or assured of your faith that dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and now I'm convinced in you also. He had known the family a long time. And that was, a, that was an unusual thing uh, uh, to, have, to have three generations of faith. What a, what a rich and wonderful blessing. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, in development to, unto Philemon or Philemon, who are dearly beloved fellow laborers. Now, we, we think probably Phil, uh, Philemon was a pastor. We don't know that for sure. But even if he wasn't, he was a fellow laborer. And, and, and men, you need to understand and know that you're a fellow laborer. If you're not a preacher... You're still a fellow laborer. There's responsibilities that fall you. Uh, you know, I, I believe the worst thing that we could have bother, borrowed from the Methodist people is the fact that, that the pastor is the only one that has to do anything. Uh, this church, that this community belongs to this church. Well, it's our responsibility, not just mine. It's your responsibility too. And we'll find that these two men took it very, very seriously, and this young helper, Philemon, uh, was involved in it. Verse 2 And to our beloved Abbaia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. And that's a wonderful thing, you know. Uh, uh, 
Thank God for a good building, but isn't it a wonderful thing that we don't even have to have a building to be a church? Uh, when, whenever we, uh, you know, you know who convinced us of that? That was Catholics. We, we don't need, you know, the church never has and never will be a building. Uh, it's a nice place to meet, but it, it has nothing to do with, uh, with with who we are as an entity and as a group of believers. And and they understood that. Verse three, grace to you. Now, as he's opening this letter and, and read it very short, he makes it compact. He wanted them to m remember the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unmerited favor. Not because we requested it. Certainly not because we deserved it. But the unmerited favor of God. You know why I'm here this morning? Because of the unmerited favor of God. Some people will say, well, it's because you've been coming up here for 30 years. No, it's not because of that. It's because of the goodness of God. Because see, relying on myself, I wouldn't be here Wednesday night. But because of the goodness of God and one more service of favor from Him, I'll be here. And so they understood that. He reminded them of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was always needed. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of thee always in prayers. Now, uh, uh, a, good, a good measure of where you're at spiritually is always your prayer life. You know, if you, have, if you can't connect with the Lord, you have a spiritual problem somewhere. If you don't have a closeness to Him that you can uh, present uh, your circumstance before them, before Him, then you have then you have an issue somewhere in your prayer life. Remember, uh, I think David said one time that that he stood alone with the Lord. There was nobody else standing with him except for the Lord. He the the, the enemy coming in, taking the women and the children, and, and and he was there alone. Paul said that not, that, that, not that the Lord stood by him. Right. Yeah. And and that 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 is the kind of thing. Uh, that we've got to learn to rely on. And they were rejoicing in the fact that they had closeness to the Lord. I think God made mention of the always in my prayers. And I wonder how much prayer life we have for each other. Verse 5, hearing of thy love and faith. Now, what is the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. Love. Hearing of thy love. So when somebody thinks of Larry Lafferty, do they think of love? I'd say probably not. I can be a little short in words sometimes. That's not a good thing. At least I'm willing to admit that about myself. Uh, but he, what, what had they hear about this, this Archippus? They heard about his love. They heard about uh, what he was doing. They heard, they heard he was a kind man. They heard, they heard that he was spreading the gospel. So when people think of Matthew Lafferty, what do they think of? See, it's very important. Everybody go, you know, uh, where we became convinced, I don't care what people think about me. Well, if you're defending truth, that's one thing. But if you're being a smart aleck, that's another thing. See, if it's just because you want to cause trouble, you know what? You need to worry about what people think about you. Because, see, here we find that what, what they heard about this young man was how he presented how he presented love, hearing of thy love and faith. Now, I want you to see what the Scriptures doesn't say. It doesn't say the faith, meaning the oracle was handed down to the, from the Lord Jesus Christ to the apostles and to us. It was faith, meaning how, how much he believed God would do what he would do. Say he would do. That, that's trusting faith. The faith is truth, and faith by itself is how much do you trust God. And apparently, this young man trusted God a great deal. Uh, do you think he can heal? Do you think he can restore? Do you think do you think he can do these things? Because certainly that's what the scriptures do teach. And we, you know what? We live in a day and age today where almost holiness. People, Pentecostal, you know what? If I didn't believe in divine healing, I wouldn't teach and preach it, would you? Now, I'll say this, I don't think I can demand it from God, but I'm sure going to go before Him and ask Him. Amen. I'm going to go before Him and ask Him because I know certainly that, 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 that I've witnessed it and I know that it's true. And so this man had that type of faith, hearing of thy love and thy faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints or believers. Verse 6, And the communication of thy faith. 
That's really what we're going to be focusing on today, is the communication of that faith. How are you going to communicate that? Because, see, they, they had heard somehow about this young man. He said, I've heard of your faith and I've heard, I, I, I've, heard, I've heard of it. So how are you going to communicate? You know, not everybody can speak well. I really needed my daughter yesterday. Uh, she, uh, my wife is going, taking her to other booths, teaching her how to spend money. And, uh, but there was a deaf couple that came by the booth yesterday. Everybody was, nobody was there but me. And what little bit I could communicate with them, I did. And they were thrilled. That's one way that I can communicate just a little bit. See, we need to know how to communicate. We need to know how to transfer the gospel in different ways. We need to know those things. Uh, if we're going to be effective people, and you know, whether you realize it or not, and you say, oh, I'm not able to do that, I'm not going to do that, I can't do that, I'm able. Well, you're communicating something every day. Listen, I know every one of you, and every one of us have one of these, and every one of us is on Facebook, and every one of us knows how, you know, how to communicate. Do we not? We know how to communicate. And, and many of us know how to communicate more than one way. My wife can communicate with her face with me. And you know what I'm saying? She's the only say word. Okay. I don't know what I did, but I did something. Right? Communicate. And, that, and, that, and that's, that, that's what we as the Lord's people need to understand and know is how we are to transpose the gospel. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual. How? By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So He tells us how to do it. Well, uh, I want you to acknowledge every good thing in you. What? 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 Do we, you know what? If we began to do that this evening, we'd be here till the midnight. You know, uh, we read in the Acts when Paul, uh, Paul was preaching through the night. There's a man up in the loft that fell asleep and fell down and killed him. You know what? Uh, everybody said, "Well, you know, he must have been long-winded." He was probably speaking of the good things that Christ had done. And it would take the fullness of the rest of the time that we had. You know what? Uh, we could not be here even for me to complete the goodness. That, you know what? Uh, it, it never ceases to amaze me. Just ten miles south of here in Carlisle, the Lord saved my soul. And the only thing that I can say, it was because of the goodness of God. I did nothing. I, I, I had nothing. I was unworthy and undeserving. And He came and spoke life to me, not the other way around. Dead people can't pray, can they? No, certainly they can't. He breathed the life into me, a spiritual life that I've never known. And I have never ever been the same since. See, that's the good thing that she's done. Besides that, everybody's heard this but you. They, uh, when they removed my kidney, and I was, uh, they, uh, they just told mom, said, all we can tell you after 12 hours is we've moved him from the critical list to the very critical list. And you know, uh, 1969, they didn't know what they do now about operating on infants. But you know what? <laughs> Here I am today. I bought him 49. You know why? Because of the goodness. And he did that for me. He, because he's good and, and righteous and kind. Amen. That, that's why he did it. You, uh, it, it never, uh, and, and you know what? I, I've never gone hungry. Now, I wanted something different. You know, mom always, mom taught me that. It's different between being hungry and wanting something different. Because I really, honestly, and I still love them today, but for a while there, I would burn out on cornbread and beans. I'd just burn out. I never want to see them again. But I wasn't hungry. I just didn't want them. You know what I'm saying? There, there, there is a difference. I've never been hungry. I, I, I can truly say that. I've never really ever been truly hungry. God's been good to me. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I, have, I have the vehicle to drive. It, it may not be stylish, but I have something that gets me not only from home to work, it gets me home again safely. I don't have to get out and pound the pavement. God's been good to me. 
I have, I have four wonderful children. God's been good to me. What, what more could it have? You know, uh, me and Donna uh, soon be married. Uh, we've been married over 29 years. Soon be 30 years. God's been good to me. You know, what's the, you know, without the goodness of God, what's the likelihood in our modern day that two teenagers getting married last for 30 years? God's been good to me. And see, we need to begin to really be able to attribute that and find some way to say, hey, we need to communicate this more and we need to find ways to communicate and methods to acknowledge every, every good thing. And we could go on and on and on and on. And you know what? Even, and I'll give you a hymn writer to look up this way, Lydia Baxter, you look her up this week. She's paralyzed from her shoulders down. Wrote some of the best hymns you'll ever. And you know what? All she talked about was the goodness of God. Now, if you was paralyzed from your shoulders down, would you speak of the goodness of God? I hate to get to humming drum. It's really, I know I would. I, I'm just, I'm just being honest because I, I've taken care of paralyzed people. And listen, it, it, you know that's a pretty miserable life when you literally depend on everything from somebody else. That's a miserable life. And people say, oh, I'd be all right with it. Well, uh, let's see it when it happens. You know what I'm saying? I'm just being realistic as a nurse. Listen, that's not a pleasant life. Right? But God can be in it. You know what? <laughs> it is at least life, is it not? <laughs> what did Paul learn after probably 25 years in ministry? Whatsoever state where I am, there I will be content. A long, a long, a long, took him a long time to learn that lesson, didn't it? It has me too. But whatever, whatever that situation is, so we then, as the Lord's people, we need to be able to speak of the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to go with me back to the book of Acts. Acts 26. And um, I want to read just a little bit there. Acts 26. And we're going to begin reading in verse 13 for time's sake. Acts 26, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them that journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice saying unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, I want you to get the, the full situation here because, see, Paul is giving his testimony. Now, if you follow the ministry and the life of Paul, he gave his full testimony four separate occasions, and he reviewed exactly what happened on the Damascus Road to four different individuals four different times. And, and he was always willing to tell what had happened to him. And he says, I, you know what? Uh, <laughs> Lord saves me, you know, there wasn't no, no bells and whistles and all that stuff people talk about today, but I do know this, He spoke life to a very much a hell-deserving sinner. Twelve-year-old boy, you say, well, what, you, you know, uh, what can a twelve-year-old boy do? Well, listen, God doesn't measure sin like you and I measure sin. I was born a reprobate. I was born against God in every, every way. If you don't believe that, then you don't believe it. that we really need a Savior. And, 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 and so we... Uh, uh, and he's saying, you know, what, 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 wonderful, what a wonderful thing that could be. So as Paul is beginning to review this and talk about this, he said, I, uh, I heard him speak to me. Verse 15, and I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now, listen, in that day, we, we, we say Lord like nothing today. We really don't understand even what we're saying. Uh, you hear about, you know, I hear people at work and it just, just cooks me good. And you hear them say, oh Lord. Well, they ain't calling on the Lord God of the Bible in any facsimile whatsoever. That, that's just a, an ex, you know, just a little something they can swear out there is all they really mean by that. But listen, in that day, when he was acknowledging, oh Lord, when he said, Lord, he was saying, you're sovereign. You're holy. You're my advocate. 
advocate. You're you you you're you're a one. You I I know you intimately, and you're my advocate. That was saying, Lord, uh, it, it was a local ruler is what it was, and he says, Lord, and uh, who art thou, Lord? Um, you know what? If, if you really call him Lord, you'll follow. Him. And if you don't, you won't. If you, if you call Him Lord, you will follow His leading. And, and, and if you don't, you won't. Uh, then He says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto, who, unto, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now, so he, he, he told them exactly. And, uh, you know, uh, isn't it a wonderful thing how the Lord Jesus is sovereign? Because if you, if you read in Acts chapter 9, in the first accounting of that, He also appeared to... Uh, he also appeared to the, appeared to the believer at Antioch too. So, so he prepared things on both ends. Do you know? Mm -hmm. What well, what a wonderful thing! You know what? There has never been a situation when he's leading you to do something that he didn't prepare it the other way around. You see what I'm saying? Uh, that that that's because he's sovereign. And so we found Paul giving a wonderful, great testimony to the only man that could set him free. Now, if, if you were locked up and you were fixing to lose your head, what would you say to them? Would you take time to share the gospel with them? Or, uh, or would you be, you know, you, you know what, Agrippa, I don't know what these people are doing, but you know what, I am a loyal Roman citizen and I will do whatever is necessary to get out of this mess. No, he shared the gospel because he knew that was the only thing that Agrippa really stood in need of. Amen. Um, and we need to be, uh, we need to do the very, very same thing as the Lord's people is continue even unto the end. Verse 19, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavy, heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Now there's a little phraseology that Baptists don't like. Right? What was the first message of John the Baptist? Repent. What was the first message of the Lord Jesus Christ? Repent. And what was apparently Paul's very first message too? Repent. See, we, 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 you don't have that anymore. And you know why? This is it. People are no longer sorry for their sins. Yeah. Now they may be sorry to get caught, but as far as being really truly repentant about sin, about sin, I don't think they are. See, that's where your little easy believism comes in. It, it becomes like you, you're not interested in God, you're interested in avoiding hell. And, 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 when, and, when it, and, and when that's the situation, you know what it leaves out? It leaves out repentance. It really does. Because see, then you're in control and God's not in control. It, you, know, uh, you know, everybody, uh, everybody's in control of his own destiny. You know what? That's a lie right out of the pits of hell. You are not in control of your own destiny. Right. We'd like to be, wouldn't we? Did they not make them gods unto themselves? That's what that's what the Bible says, and, and we do the same things, the same thing every day. And, and so we see then that Paul was teaching them, preaching unto them repentance. Verse twenty-one: For this call, the, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained the help of God, I continue to this day witnessing both to the small and the great, saying none other than those things which. The prophets and Moses did say should come that Christ must suffer and should and should be the first that should rise from the dead and show a light unto the Gentiles <laughs> and to the people and a light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, 
Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doeth make thee mad or crazy. <laughs> you, ever, you ever wish that I'd shut up? <laughs> See, that's kind of that's where Festus was at. You know, Festus wanted you to get off the hook. Hey, like, you know, calm your blood. This is your opportunity. You're messing up. You, 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 you can get away tonight and be with the church this evening. Don't mess it up. Verse 25, and he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and, with, and soberness. For the king knows of these things, but for whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto him, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. So how did Paul tell it? When he was put, when he was put into the fire, he told him verbally. He used the opportunity that was given him. You know what? Uh, when we do street preaching, some people may think it's stupid, may think it's fanatical. You know what I look at? It's just an opportunity. Just an opportunity to say, hey, this is what the Lord's done for me. That, that, that this is how salvation came my way. And, and, and speak the gospel. Every opportunity that we possibly, possibly could get. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I believe the Apostle John to be the writer of uh, the Revelation. Revelation 1, I'm going to read just verses 9 and 10. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Now, you think about yourself... And have you ever really suffered tribulation for the cause of Christ? Now, I'm not talking about tribulation that you created on your own. You know, when I got a good licking when I was a boy, I did it because of my own doing. And it, 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 wasn't, a, it wasn't, God wasn't involved, right? But when you suffer tribulation because of the things of Christ, because you stand up for truth, and you, and you preach truth, and you teach truth, and as a result, you're put in prison, or you're put in... You know what? We've not suffered that yet. I think it's on the way. But we've not suffered that. We, we, we've not encountered that as of yet. It, it, it probably is forthcoming, but, but have not happened yet. And so John says, I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. Now, he wasn't on vacation. The isle of Patmos was a place where the Roman put individuals to starve to death. It was essentially a rock. It wasn't an island with sandy beaches and, and palm trees and, and coconuts. It was a rock and you was put out there to starve to death because you couldn't drink the seawater because it would kill you. And there was nothing else of sustenance out there. You were put there to die. Now, if you were in that situation this morning, what would you do? No food, no drinking water. What would you do? See, John had a choice. You know, that's another thing. Sovereign grace people, we don't necessarily like choices, but the problem is the Bible's full of them. Don't, don't blame your poor choices on God's sovereignty. Okay? Because it, 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 will never, it will never work out that way. And so, when he got out there and he had no nourishment, nothing really to go on, what was, what was he to do? And more important, what would you do? See, most of us, if you give up and got mad and say, you know what, forget about this, it's crazy, this is foolish, I, you know what, I'm done with it, I'm through with this. But notice what he said. And for the testimony of Jesus Christ, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, I'll, I'll give you two, two lines of thought on that. Two things I, uh, that, number one, yes, he was a saved individual, but he was in the Spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, capital S in your King James 
Bible. And you know what? Whether we want to acknowledge it as a Baptist people or not, you would have to say, if you can be in the Spirit, you can be out of the Spirit. We don't like that, but it's true. See, because every time I come down to the house of God, every time you come down to the house of God, and you come down to the house of God, we're not always in the Spirit. So, he had the choice. And he began to think about the goodness of God. I think he thought back to laying on his head on the Lord's breast and say, Lord is God. You know, this is good. I'm fixing to go home. All he knew, he was going to thirst or starve to death. He began to think of the goodness of God. How He brought him along. What He'd done for him. So he began to get happy. <laughs> began to be excited. Listen, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Why? Because he didn't get beat down. He didn't get discouraged. He didn't get, he didn't get to the point of quitting. And notice what happened. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and heard behind me a great voice as is of a trumpet. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. You know what? He would have never experienced that, nor have we ever enjoyed it, if he had been in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. That, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Not? Yeah. And you know what? He remembered it. Now, uh, you young boys, I ain't that many of you left? Use your memory while you have it because mine, mine's starting to slip. I don't remember as well as I used to. Because see, he was out there by himself. They didn't give him, they didn't give him water, they didn't give him food, and they sure didn't give him pen and paper. So he had, to, he had to keep this for a little while. But when he was released, he wrote it down. Right. And he wrote it down for my benefit and your benefit and all the Lord's redeemed of all the ages for, for our benefit. See, so what I'm telling you, the other thing to do, write it down. Write down <laughs> what the Lord did with, for you when He saved you so. You know, I've thought about my grandbabies. Uh, I need to write that down so when I'm gone, they flip through my stuff and say, man, granddaddy really... <laughs> He wasn't much, but he knew the Lord. I, 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 want, I, I, want, I want it written down. Do you see what I'm saying? And you should decide that. You know what? You, may, you might not have a speaking voice at all. But every one of you can read and write. Write it down. Let people know what the Lord did for you. And the Lord will honor that. And blessing you see from the very thing that we have today, the entire book of the Revelation was written just that, just that way. Go with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms 78. Psalm 78 and verse 35. Psalm 78 and verse 35. The Bible says. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Now, another thing you can do is remember. Now, I've said for years, you stow up your King James Bibles and you hang on to them because there are some of you under the sound of my voice that will see the day that it's illegal. Because see, uh, it, the truthfulness and the cry against sodomy in that book is it very much hated truth. And that, 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 that's going to be stomped. And listen, that's the approach they'll take. And if you think I'm crazy, you just wait around. In fact, I'll say this, if Hillary Clinton had gotten president, it would have already been that way. Yep. And, and, and so, huh, you know what? It might come down to just remember. Now, I'm going to hang on to mine whoever thing I've got and there's places in Surrey County I can take you right now that you ain't never been before. And I'll, and I'll hide it as long as I can. But there'll be a day, you know what? I might have to go, you know, by grace are you saved. And I might have to remember Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I, I, I might have to remember come out from among them and be separate. See, because I may not have it anymore. 
They, they, and you know what? They remembered a better time. They, they remember when things weren't as close. Well, this is the nation of Israel. And because of their rebellion and their ungodliness and their affinity for sin, they was in a mess. And they remembered a better time. And, and we, need to be, we need to be that kind of individuals too where we, where we, that, that, we share that with the generation that lies ahead of us and before us. Verse 36, Nevertheless, they did flatter Him with their mouth and lied unto Him with their tongues, for their heart was not right with Him. Now, neither were they steadfast in His covenant. Now, did you get that? Even though they knew about God, their heart was not right with God. You know what? I dare say that that sums up the most of what people call Christianity today. You know what? Somebody says, Oh yes, I love Jesus. I just don't go to church. They're a bunch of hypocrites. I'll worry about it. You know what? If, if we believe in God's sovereignty, and I do, we also have to believe in perseverance of the saints to we not? They will. You know what? <laughs> He's promised the redeemed will last. But what does He say to the other? They went out from you because they were not of you. What? From the beginning. Right. Yeah. Right? We want, we want to just cartwheel on eternal security, don't we? What about eternal service? Let's cartwheel on that one. Right? We, we, we have to believe it both ways, do we not? And, and so we see then that the, the nation of Israel, and, and really even still today, they've not come to full repentance. They've not acknowledged Christ nationally, and they will not for, I think, a few more years. <laughs> but they remembered. You know what? Uh, I don't go by hardly that little road around by your mom and dad, behind the backside of your mom and daddy's house where the old school is without thinking about when the Lord saved you. Because I've heard it so many times. I know that you, you contemplated walking up that hill. That's good. Uh, I, I, if you're not around, I'll tell them. Right? I'll remember that. If nothing else, I'll remember that. And I hope that mine, when they swing through Carlisle, if they ever do, and they say, well, my daddy was saved right in that little building right over there. That's where the Lord saved him. I want you to remember that. See, sometimes, <laughs> it may be memory is all we got. Right? If that book became precious like it is in some nations, you have one little sheet for yourself, then, then you'd be glad to get the full counsel again. I want to I wanna read one more place. And we're going to be done. Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. In the very first verse, it came to pass when all the people were clean, and it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe of man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm. Man, I could preach on that all day. Twelve stones. And ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye lodge this night. And Joshua called the twelve men when he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every, every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan. Take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel that this might be a sign among you. And when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, what mean ye these stones? Then ye shall answer them. Now, did you get that? They're, they're fixing over to cross over and begin taking the land. Jordan River in full flood was split open just like the Red Seas was for Moses. And they about all cross. And he said, get you, get you a stone and you put it on the other side. 
Now, uh, what what's significant about that is this: that 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 river Jordan is not a pretty river. It is a muddy, rough river. Uh, it is not uh, it is not calm like the Cumberland. Certainly not calm like the the Tennessee River. It's rough. And it was a miraculous thing to bring that out and say, look, this was at the bottom of the river. Mm-hmm. Another thing, and, and I don't appreciate the East Tennessee mountains like other people do, but over there, uh, the, rough, the creeks are so rough, the rocks bolt around all the time, just as round as a ball, smooth like glass. And uh, that's the kind of stuff, he said, I want, you, I want you to bring this up out of it and place it there. And when the kids ask, you tell them. That's why we need to do that today. My Bella asked, you know, uh, why don't you got any pictures of Jesus in here? And I'd say, well, because we're not idolaters. And the building is kind of specific, ain't it? They, they, they need to know that. Why don't we have a cross up there? She needs to know that, don't she? Right. Needs to understand that. And so, tell your children. Tell your children why you do that. Ladies, tell your children why you don't wear breeches. Men, tell your children why you don't wear dresses. He said, that's stupid, Larry. Well, about another five years it won't be stupid. Right. Tell them. Those are all ways that we can communicate. Those are all ways that we can pass it to the next generation. Remember, we're telling them everything that that He's done. How He's brought us, what He's did for us. From the provision of of a dollar bill to the saving of your soul. You let them know it came from God. You let them know how good He's been to you what He's done for you. It, it, it should thrill our hearts. You know what? It never ceases to amaze me. Uh, men, we had an opportunity right now to go, hey, this, let's stop and let me tell you how good God's been to me. Amen. And we don't do it. That's right. That's right. The Bible teaches us to be silent in the assembly. I bet they'd like to. Right? <laughs> And we have the opportunity and don't. God help us. 